Just before we get started with this video, I want to say that it's brought to you by me, or rather another channel I do called Business Blaze. More on that in a bit if you'd like to check it out now though, there's a link below. The Power Rangers are a cultural juggernaut that have been a staple of kids' entertainment for over two decades now, an impressive feat considering that the original Mighty Morphin Power Rangers series was literally cobbled together from snippets from a popular Japanese series called Super Sentai, more specifically the 16th series of Super Sentai, known in Japan as Kyoryu Sentai Zoranger. Maybe. <laughs> also, fun note, Never seen Power Rangers. How about that? My parents, I think they thought it was too violent. So, how did they cannibalize such a show and repackage it into a different story arc? Well, enter Israeli-American businessman Haim Saban. Sometime in the late 1980s, Saban, who was at the time primarily known for composing soundtracks for various children's programs, was on a business trip to Japan when he turned on his TV and saw a random episode of Kyoru Sentai Zoranger. Despite having absolutely no idea what was going on, Saban was still entertained by the show's fighting scenes, and this gave him a novel idea. Why not just take those fight scenes, cobble together a random story around them using new actors, and then package it up for kids? Heim reasoned that kids wouldn't really care all that much about the plot, given that the show contained giant dinosaur robots and fun fight scenes. What more could you want? He also realized that the bright, easily distinguishable characters in each episode could potentially result in lucrative toy sales if the show ever caught on. <laughs> Apparently, merch has been a thing forever. On top of that, since all the special effects laden battle scenes had already been filmed and produced with masked characters, all one would have to do was record new voiceovers and some very cheap live-action stuff to tie it all together. With this in mind, Haim hurriedly workshopped the idea for a pilot episode with the help of his business partner, Shuki Levy. He dubbed his version of the show The Mighty Morphing Power Rangers and then promptly did nothing with it for about eight years. You see, despite how inexpensive the show had potential to be, few studios were willing to take a chance on such a weird idea. It wasn't until Saban was able to bend the ear of an executive from Fox Kids, Margaret Loesch, in 1993, citing the massive toy sales the franchise generated in its native Japan, that the show was greenlit. Of course, Saban still needed the rights to use the footage from the original Japanese show, so he got in contact with the owners of the Super Sentai brand, toy company LTD or TOEI and Bandai and negotiated for the rights to use footage from all 50 episodes of the Japanese show. He then gave the material to a group of editors and writers, tasked them with combing through it all to cobble together as many semi-coherent plots as possible. They just, <laughs> they just had to be halfway there. It's for kids. It doesn't matter. We've seen Teletubbies. Clearly, they don't care. The idea here was for around half of each episode to consist of footage from the original Japanese show... <laughs> And it definitely says in the script here the original name, but I'm just calling it the original Japanese show from now on because I'm getting sick of butchering Japanese. Anyway, the rest of the time is going to be filled with live-action footage about high school students taking part in wacky adventures, more or less in the same vein as Saved by the Bell. <laughs> yeah, only with more ninjas and dinosaur robots <laughs> and stuff like that and Japanese people with masks on. <laughs> As nobody on the writing staff spoke Japanese, they chose to mostly ignore the plot of the original Japanese show that they were adapting and just made up their own plot as they went along. To this end, some episodes of Mighty Morphing Power Rangers used footage and fight sequences from multiple episodes of the Japanese show that were edited together to better fit the new storylines. These storylines invariably involved the heroes walking around a lot of nondescript quarries where seemingly all of their battles took place. The writers also eventually incorporated aspects of other Super Sentai series and then used editing tricks to hide the fact that they weren't in the same shot as the other heroes. The best example of this was the White Ranger, who was originally from an entirely separate series called Gosai Sentai Dai Ranger and was played by a nine-year-old boy. Speaking of the Power Rangers, as an additional cost-saving measure, Saban chose to hire unknown actors to play the Rangers. Their pay was reportedly so low, in fact, that three of the original actors left the show in the second series over it, with Austin St. John, the original Red Ranger, once quipping, I could have worked the window at McDonald's and probably made the same money the first season. It was disappointing, it was frustrating, it made a lot of us angry. 
But on the plus side, <laughs> at least he didn't have to do any of the fight scenes. The actors chosen to play the Power Rangers were hired mostly for their martial arts or athletic ability, and many episodes revolved around them demonstrating their athleticism to make their fighting prowess in the repurposed Super Sentai footage more believable to the audience. A conscious decision was <laughs> imagine just one of them's really fat. <laughs> and in the fight scenes, he's just a completely different dude. <laughs> he's like a giant fat American. <laughs> And he's just a small Japanese man. Oh, A conscious decision was also made to make the Power Rangers a diverse group of teenagers to maximize the show's appeal. This sort of casting did cause a few problems, however. For example, many were quick to point out the possible racial connotations of having a black man and an Asian descent woman play the black and yellow rangers respectively. No, they didn't, did they really? <laughs> a second less noticed problem, who wouldn't notice that? <laughs> was that in the original Japanese show, the Yellow Ranger, known as the Tiger Ranger in the Japanese version, was played by a man. Whereas in the American version, the character was played by the aforementioned Asian woman, Soi Trang, who tragically died in a car accident at the age of 27 on September the 3rd, 2001. That got dark. It's like, hey, we're talking about fun Power Rangers. Oh, she's dead. While the gender discrepancy is mostly moot due to the fact that only Japanese footage of the Yellow Ranger shows them in full costume, there are moments where a a clearly defined crotch bulge can be seen on the Yellow Ranger during some fight scenes. Oh, in yet another cost-saving measure, as Zordon wasn't in the original Japanese series. <laughs> Who's Zordon? I know nothing about Power Rangers. In yet another cost-saving measure, as Zordon wasn't in the original Japanese series, and thus some special effects were needed for the scenes the character was in, the decision was made to just reuse the same exact footage of him over and over again. This is why you may have noticed that Zordon's dialogue and his talking head don't really match up that well in many cases. Released in 1993 and going against even Saban's wild expectations, the nickel and dime budget Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was a massive hit with kids, generating many millions of dollars in toy and merchandise sales to go along with more direct profits from the show. This left Fox with a rather unique problem. They'd already used all the possible footage from the 50 episodes of the original Japanese show in order to create 40 Power Rangers episodes. But they needed more. Go just play it backwards. Problem solved. To solve the issue, Fox contacted TOEI directly and worked out a deal to have them create 25 brand new monster costumes, which they'd use to film a bunch of fight scenes, which would then be sent over to Fox and used to create more episodes. TOEI had previously done similar work for Fox at the request of American writers who needed the occasional new shot to flesh out a storyline. Just do it yourself, guys. Come on. Most notable among this work was to film more footage of the Green Ranger, an immensely popular character in the American version that was killed off in the original Japanese show, so they had limited footage available. Midway through production of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, TOEI also sent over the original hero costumes from Kyoro Sentai Zoo Ranger, the Wide Ranger costume, and some of the cheaper monster costumes they had so Fox could film their own fight scenes if they needed to. While Fox and Saban did eventually create some original fight scenes using those props, the Costumes were mostly worn by the actors, sans helmet, to flesh out pre-recorded fight scenes. In the end, Fox and Saban's company, Saban Entertainment, were able to turn the extra footage into 20 additional episodes for the original series, with a little left over to create a handful of episodes for the second series. Realizing the long-term potential of their unique relationship, Saban also worked out a deal with TOEI to adapt the next series of Super Sentai, noting that this would allow them to not only create more episodes, but upgrade the Power Rangers' giant battle robots, presenting an opportunity to create even more toys and merchandise. This thing is a money machine. From here, a lot of rinsing and repeating has been done to the present day. As for Haim Saban, he's leveraging the success of Power Rangers, along with using the same basic existing footage formula for a few other shows, to build a nice little entertainment empire with his personal net worth currently estimated to be over $3 billion and only about two and a half decades after Power Rangers debuted. So look, if you're enjoying this sort of businessy episode, I think you'll also enjoy another channel from me called Business Blaze. It's filled with facts and knowledge, but it's in a more laid back format. Sort of like this episode of Today I Found Out. We've sort of started integrating a little bit of that Business Blaze flavor into Today I Found Out. And mostly you seem to like it. Let me know below. But that's what Business Blaze is. It's basically 
just 90% that, with some facts thrown in. It looks at the most epic failures and times things went wrong, but also little-known successes, generally just the weirdest stuff that I could find from the business world, like the biggest giveaway failures in business history, what went wrong with a fire festival, or just epic blazes where I knock out 30 crazy business facts. Those go on for about an hour, I stand up doing it, my legs get tired. Anyway, like I said, it's a bit more laid back than this channel, throwing a good amount of fun and silliness at you with your facts. Check it out through the link below, or just search Business Blaze in YouTube and you will find it. And now for a bonus fact. Speaking of giant roaring monsters, ever wonder how the classic Godzilla roar was made? Well, no, but I guess we're gonna find out. Well, wonder no more. As Godzilla was designed to be an unnatural combination of various creatures, both alive and dead, the sound crew found it especially difficult to come up with something that worked for its roar. According to famed composer, oh my God. <laughs> Akira Ifukube. According to famed composer Akira Ifukube, who created both Godzilla's roar, the sound of its footsteps, and composed the film's soundtrack, sound engineers went to a local zoo and recorded the roars and cries of virtually every animal that was there to try and come up with something usable. They then tried a number of combinations of these sounds to create something distinct, failing each time because the resulting roar always sounded too familiar. Ikafube notes that the engineers eventually got so desperate that they even tried distorting the cries of random animals like herons to the point that they were unrecognizable, but nothing was satisfactory. The problem, at least in Ikafube's eyes, was that the roars of other animals, even when heavily distorted, still sounded too natural. What they really wanted was a unique sound like nothing heard from an animal before, but still animal-like and a little terrifying. Thus, scrapping all the previous sounds, despite working under an incredibly tight deadline, Ikafube decided to look for other potential means to make the roar. For the solution, he states, For the roar of Godzilla, I took out the lowest string of a contrabass and then ran a glove that had resin on it across the string. The different kinds of roars were created by playing the recording of the sound that I'd made at different speeds. The resin on the glove helped create the added friction needed while being dragged across the string to make an incredibly grating sound that would hopefully cause a feeling of unease in those who heard it, akin to nails on a chalkboard, but with more depth. Godzilla! King of the Monsters! It's alive! Attempting to recreate some version of Ikafube's sounds for the 2014 version, Eric Ardal and Ethan Vanderin, who created the new roar, stated, We dissected that original roar and figured out exactly which key musically it was in, which is a C to D on the piano, and the finishing bellow that has the same notes on a lower octave. We figured out the timing, cadence, and musical pitch of that original roar, and then started to experiment with different ways to recreate it. After a whopping six months of experimenting, they settled on a combination of sounds, though as to how they came up with them, they've promised to take that secret with them to the grave. Said Adal, I think more so than any other sound effect we've designed, we have a certain protectiveness over that sound. It's when you're giving voice to something, you're giving it its soul. And if we tell everybody exactly how we did it, people will think of that when they hear the roar, and we want them to think of Godzilla. That said, what little they have revealed is that the sounds, much like Ikafube's, was the product of friction using something man-made rather than modifying an animal sound. They also note that over the course of their experiments, they played with things like car doors with rusty hinges, as well as rubbing the heads of drums, among other things. They further state that they found that using the plastic sole from a hiking boot on the strings of a double bass produced the closest they could get to the original roar in their experiments. During the course of all this, to get an even more unique sound, Vanderin states, we bought a microphone that was able to record above the range of human hearing. We started experimenting with all different types of sounds, sounds that we couldn't actually hear when we were recording. But when we slowed them down into the human range of perception, we had an incredible palette of normally invisible sounds that people normally don't get to hear. Finally, to get proper echo sounds, as well as what it would sound like from within a building or a car, etc., basically different ways it might be heard in the final film, they managed to convince the band Rolling Stones to let them use their tour speakers. They then set everything up outside at various locations at Warner Brothers Studios and simply blared the roars at high volume and recorded the result from various other locations nearby. Naturally, they got some complaints about this, with Ardell stating, The neighbors started tweeting like, Godzilla's at my apartment door, and we're getting phone calls from Universal studios across town because tour groups were asking, what's all that commotion going on down in the valley? The sound we were playing actually traveled over three miles, a hundred thousand watts of pure power. 
Going back to the original Godzilla, if you're wondering about the aforementioned footstep sounds, according to Ikafube, the story behind those was one of Toho's electrical engineers made a simplistic amplifying device some time before the production on Godzilla, King of the Monsters, got underway. It was just a box that had several coils connected to an amplifier and a speaker in it. When you struck it, the coils would vibrate and a loud shocking sound would be created. I accidentally stepped on the device while I was conducting the score for a movie that was produced shortly before Godzilla, King of the Monsters was made. I said, what the heck is that? when I heard the noise that was produced. When I was asked to create Godzilla's footfalls, I decided to use the device. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do smash that like button below and do not forget to subscribe for brand new videos just like this every day of the week. For more from me, check out that Business Blaze channel, which is linked to below. And thank you for watching.